I think that was a perfect setting to our um, many, many discussions and panel discussions ahead because she really beautifully bridged the gap uh, of the past, present and the future. And also, as Dr. Reddy rightfully said, that Bangalore has to be the Bangalore or Karnataka rather has to be the uh, IT capital and how it has to be the place where uh, we have a strong Indo-French cooperation in, in just not IT, but I think the, the keynote by the speakers have already proved that there's a history which existed between Lyon in France and also the Karnataka, uh, which includes Mysore and Bangalore. So I think we are quite uh, well set when it comes to the background for today's discussions. And uh, I really, really thank both the keynote speakers for really, really throwing out all this information to us, uh, which is not known to many, I guess. And uh, I hope the audience has uh, a lot of take home messages from this keynote uh, speakers today. So now uh, we are sort of coming to the end of the morning session. So I would uh, sort of give you some sort of nourishment with some coffee and uh, some snacks. So I guess our volunteers will guide all of you uh, to break this morning session to the coffee place which has been arranged for you. Uh, and we can continue all the discussions over there and come back here at around uh, 11, 11 o'clock, I guess, for the panel discussions. Uh, so that uh, we can start our day with uh, a lot of uh, agreements, disagreements, discussions, interactions. E-commerce, trends and technology to please come on to the stage and uh, occupy your positions. I think we will start. Let's start and I, I just uh, forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ambika and I'm from the French Institute in India and the French Embassy in India. And I, I guess you will have to bear with me for the two full days because uh, I think we will try and put something together and connect people. Um, so, as the, so we start the most exciting thing of this conference, which is a panel discussions, which can result in arguments, opinions, uh, we'll see as it comes. And so the first panel discussion is uh, on e-commerce technology and trends. It's the only tech panel here, I would say, uh, but of course the other panels do have technology, technologists. I think I'll just go behind because I don't think... Uh, <laughs> You, I, I think I'm blocking everyone. So even if it's about technology and trends, I think um, there is, a, the, as you can see, the panelists, maybe some of you might be knowing them, uh, but they are all coming from very diverse backgrounds and what they're trying to do is also very, very diverse. So I can't uh, wait to throw that information on to you. So without further ado, I would uh, uh, start the panel discussions by a short introduction by all the panelists. So here we are trying to have a mix of academia and industry uh, working at the interface of uh, AI, design, fashion. So this is uh, something which is sort of do justice to the title of the conference as well, which is AI in fashion and design. And I would like to ask the console team to just give me a couple of mics, if that's possible. Okay, okay, thank you. So you can use those mics and uh, I think it's working. If it's not working, just let them know. Yeah, great. So I would, I would start now with um, the introduction of the uh, International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore, Triple ITB, who was our host for the hackathon. Uh, the director of the institute, Dr. Das, is here. So I would uh, start this panel by an introduction um, by him. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ambika. And so nice of you to invite me and also to the French Embassy. And this topic is very, very important and interesting in the point of that AI in fashion design. And artificial intelligence has been there for decades, but uh, now due to the huge data available, and also the computational speed, which has increased a lot. So we will come to the topic. Before that, let me introduce myself. Myself, uh, Debra Das. I'm the director of IIIT Bangalore, in short we call. And it is a mainly a uh, technical institute, which emphasizes on computer science and electronics, um, uh, communication engineering. But it has a, another two branches, which is very interesting, which I'll talk about that the technology and society impact. We call it as a digital society because we are moving more and more to the digital world. So uh, in, in that digital world, how it will impact the society? 
So uh, that way I'll be speaking. So this is only introduction. So let me, uh, I introduce myself. So you want to uh, speak about the topic or later on? No, we will come to the topic. It's just a one-liner or two-liner introduction for people to sort of understand where you come from and what is the background if they don't know you. So over to you, Hema. Hi, everybody. My name is Hema. I am a co-founding member of an AI-based uh, fashion forecasting startup called Stylomia. Uh, incidentally, I think I'm the only fashion background on this panel, if I'm not sure. Uh, so I have always been a fashion buyer, merchandiser. And uh, five years ago, I quit it all to start this company uh, to make fashion a more environmental and economically sustainable business. So that's about me. Um, over to Garu. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> great pleasure being here, uh, Ambika, French MC. Uh, I am Gaurav Bhalotia. I had technology at uh, Udan. So I am a hardcore techie. Uh, uh, so what we do, Rick, Udan is a B2B e-commerce platform. And we are empowering small entrepreneurs, uh, retailers. We call Kirana shops, right, to uh, buy products which they in turn sell to their buyers. And lifestyle is one large category for us, right, fashion. I think that's where the intersection is. And uh, there are a bunch of cool technologies, right, we, we deploy, right, uh, for our buyers to figure out, right, what to buy. And hence, we actually influence the distribution and shape some of the demand. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sridhar. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Senseforth.ai. We are a conversational AI platform. Um, we provide automated conversations at scale between uh, organizations and people. And um, we're also pioneering uh, conversational commerce uh, for leading brands in the world. So where you, know, you actually shop uh, by conversing across multi-channels. Thank you. Good morning, uh, uh, all of you. So my name is Chiranjeev. I'm a faculty member in the computer science department of ISC. In Institute of Science, I, I think all of you know. You may not know me, but yeah, so Ambika said one line. So, so this one <laughs> line is Two about, lines, it's two okay. Lines. So one more line is why am I here? Uh, so I work in machine learning, mainly foundations. But several years ago, I had the opportunity to work with a corporation on how AI can impact, especially e-commerce in the space of fashion. And that was quite fascinating glimpse. So I'll bore you to death if you allow me later. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Vinu Siti. Uh, I'm a, a faculty at IAM Trichy. Uh, my identity, I'm mainly a statistician, two post graduation statistics. And uh, I work five years, IT and analytics. Uh, the last seven years, I am teaching at IAM Trichy. I mainly teach analytics subjects. Last three years, I am teaching uh, artificial intelligence course. Uh, I also teach uh, data visualization, uh, so there are also the visual perception, cognitive side, the semiotic part of it. I'm also interested in comics and puzzles and origami. Why I'm saying that? I think that is the, you know, closely related to fashion. I can think of uh, something I'm doing, so that is why I'm saying this. Okay, <laughs> so, right. So, uh, in, uh, okay, I think the specific I'll talk later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction. So I hope all of you have an idea of where they are all coming from. And we try to sort of um, uh, diversify the panel and also have uh, people from academia and the industry and uh, uh, so that we can get different perspectives. Even from the academia, it's as you can see, it's very, very, very diverse what Vinu, Chiru and uh, Dr. Das is uh, sort of uh, uh, applying or teaching. So, but before we go into the academia, I think uh, there are a bunch of things that we have to discuss to bring this discussion up. And I think that is, that is to understand, though it is from corporates. And, and I know that there is a lot of principles and uh, 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 logic be behind uh, how Stylumia or uh, Udan or Senseforth uh, really uh, work in this uh, framework of the of AI in the interface of uh, fashion and design. Udan not so much in fashion, but uh, it, it's more a general concept, and that's why we wanted Gaurav to be there. But then I just wanted to uh, ask ask uh, uh, Stylumia actually, uh, who is uh, who's represented by Hema here. Uh, 
about uh, when you uh, start uh, talking about the applications of artificial intelligence in fashion, at what level is, is it, uh, are you trying to sort of uh, bring these components together? Is it at the level of uh, design or manufacturing or marketing? How do you see that? Sure. So for us, it's always at the product level. So we influence decision making at the product level. So I'll just give you probably some statistics. Some of you might know. Uh, let's say globally, we make registered garments around 150 billion each year. And 50 billion of it goes directly to a landfill. They're not even opened. So all the work of designers is to go directly into a landfill. Forget about somebody using and throwing. Right? So what does that mean? That means we're not designing with the consumer. Consumers are not liking what they see. So whatever Stylumia does, we have three products. All of them influence decision making at the product level. Okay. What to make and how much to make. Okay, so that's, that's the feedback system that you use. So I would just take on that question further with Gaurav, uh, asking about uh, one thing is, uh, I know that your audience is very different from uh, Stylumia, and uh, just wanted to clarify uh, what kind of, uh, I know that you talked about Kirana stores and retailers, and we'll come to the sustainability bit uh, there in, in terms of employability. But then um, I, I just want to know what kind of audience are you uh, dealing with uh, in terms of whether you call it audience or client and uh, where do you apply technology, at what level? So if you see like Udan is a platform, right? So we do actually have retailers, uh, we actually divide them into class A, B, C and D buyers, right? So these could be across the spectrum, right? Uh, in terms of the styles and other things we do. Largely I would say ki we deal at this time with B, C and D, right? So start with mass market and mid market. And uh, on the same question, right, so I, th I, I believe the biggest challenge is there are so many styles, so many styles to buy, right, and deciding which one works for you in your catchment area for your audience at the price ranges, right, you are yeah. interested in, right. So those are some of the problems where we actually extensively use technology. I would say the matchmaking process, right. Right. I think in, in some way it's also pointing out towards the concept of sustainability because as uh, Hema also said that you're trying to uh, reduce uh, the waste and also having this feedback maybe helps to design, uh, help the design the market uh, to produce what is needed. So is that what you believe in Sridhar also uh, is, is, or your company has a totally different take on that? No, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, whenever I order something on e-commerce sites and you know, they come in these ugly boxes, mm -hmm. Um, and cumbersome and sometimes it's difficult to open and think about the kind of uh, you know, landfill that, that that's generating, right? Mm. Every product comes with enormous amount of packaging, um, you know, plastic and it's totally uh, unsustainable in my view. I think mm. uh, that's where the, you know, the green, green e-commerce concept comes in. Mm. Uh, we, have to, we have to figure out a way to sort of ship, people, ship you know, goods to the consumers. Um, even delivery you know, needs to be sustainable. Uh, today, you know, the whole delivery concepts are really um, badly designed. For example, let's say if there is a delivery man who is delivering something to me, uh, and the next street, maybe somebody is else is coming. The, the whole, you know, uh, orchestration of that is very, very poor. Uh, you know, I, I, this is a fascinating uh, story. In fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, study there, um, you know, whether it all, all the uh, delivery platforms, including Swiggy's and Zomato's, uh, they don't have highly optimized, um, you know, route mapping so that they can actually, you know, uh, but, but that's, that's creating a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, sustain unsustainability, right? So that's yeah. my take on it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in, before going to Chiru, I would like to ask Dr. Das that uh, when you are having the course, uh, which is about uh, artificial intelligence and society, and uh, with a very, uh, I don't think many institutes in India has that kind of a concept where you are actually looking at ethics and policy making, especially IIIT Bangalore is one of the, uh, uh, one of the pillars of the Karnataka government where you really advise the government on various measures like this. Have you come across, uh, uh, have you come across anything, uh, a concept like this where you're trying to reduce wastage and things like that and how technology can help in doing that, just not for the students but also have you had any discussion with the government related to that concept? Yeah. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ambika, for the question, which is very uh, to the point and uh, practical, which Madam Hema was talking about the 
uh, reduction of the waste, wastage and also to how to predict a customer's choice, then your reduction will come down. So we have uh, developed uh, by uh, our institute R&D funds and also the government a lab called Multimodal uh, Labs where we have used a, a virtual mirror kind of thing. A, a customer can sit in front of the mirror and he can have uh, used those all kind of uh, garments or the uh, jewelries and all and can have a, like a virtual model also he can be. So as a, he or she can be. So as a result of which uh, you, you save a lot of uh, uh, wastage or the money, time, because this competitive world where the cost has to be brought down dramatically or drastically to sustain the sustainability the word you use. And moreover that you can save that when you are doing this process going that you can save your different postures, different uh, garments, different things and you can revisit that again and again. And also the person who is building that he also studies your mind that what you like, what you don't like and he also redesign him the products in that directions. Mm. So we have been done that in our labs and also a couple of companies shown interest with this products, they have signed with the professors in, to work on that. So this is going on in one side. Mm -hmm. Other side is a little longer and more, more strenuous research required, which you were talking about is the second part is that on the ethics part. Mm -hmm. So we have a center for inter uh, internet of ethical things, which is the only one in India. And the first one in a, a internet of ethical, means that means if you are using when these kind of devices, and uh, your, your decision making may be biased by the company, maybe the policy of the government, maybe policy of the shop. Yeah. So how to make a um, consumer centric or citizen centric more ethical? Yeah. So these are the policies we are working and it, the research has started in that direction also. So it will, it will definitely bring out a lot of um, lights to the, this direction that, that algorithms which will be used should not be biased so much in these directions. Thank right, you. right. Uh, thank you for putting it forward very rightly and with that I wanted to uh, jump to Chiru actually. So I know that uh, you are quite a pioneer in that data science at the Indian Institute of Science which is actually uh, ranked number one in India. So uh, and I know that right now India is quite, a, uh, quite in a nice stage where uh, people are ready to take research solutions from academic institutions uh, and work with the companies. So one thing, the first thing I want to ask you is that when clients or companies approach you as an educational institute, do they, uh, what are the aspects that they are trying to um, get from you? So I, I guess the question is generic. I mean, nothing to do with yes. fashion or the theme of the No, generic, the generic, generic, yes. Yeah, of course. So uh, at Indian Institute of Science, we have a very open uh, atmosphere where we welcome corporations, uh, I mean, public uh, um, bodies, government to come and engage with us. Our focus always has been to do cutting edge research, but, to, but the research should be topical. That means it must and it must address the problems that society faces. And the best way to get that, as we strongly believe, is uh, a window through that is through corporations or government bodies. And to that end, you know, some infrastructure is needed. For example, IP rights, consultancy, mm, uh, protocols, etc. So ISC has a full-blown office doing that. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I will not know the details of that because I tend to, mm, you know, restrict myself to, like, you know, my research and not get into those because those are and I guess quite complicated and our lawyers have, uh, you know, discussed that. So, yeah, and, uh, and I'm quite uh, thankful uh, for uh, the place where I am because through this uh, institute, I got to work with some of the leading companies of the world and also uh, some local companies as well. Uh, yeah, so would that... Yes, I think I will, uh, I will take that last sentence or the last, second last sentence you mentioned. Um, uh, that, uh, that you are more focused on the research and not on the ethical and policy aspects of it. So I just want to uh, bring in Vinu here, who is actually from IAM Trichy, from a management school. So from a management perspective or a, or a person who is quite interested in data analytics, I just want to know uh, how, um, how important it is for a, for a researcher or, or for a person who is working in company for 
or uh, who sort of devises AI solutions and uh, doing very technical things to be aware of uh, these kind of policies. So do you do as something as an institute where you sort of bridge this gap between this sort of an awareness? I mean, they might be not be in the central point of policy making, but is it important that they're aware of it and in what way and how do you train the students if so? Okay, uh, we teach uh, AA and ethics part during in the course. Uh, so, in, if you look at fashion industry, uh, so compared to the other AA application, uh, so the, the certain things are not that important. Uh, so, something like uh, uh, like unfairness, right? Uh, or like, uh, so if for example, driverless car hit somebody, who is responsible for that? So that kind of a questions will not come in the uh, the fashion uh, part. So so unfairness and all relatively lesser than in the other application. But there is a one thing that is very important is that the data privacy part, right? So uh, uh, the how the our purchasing history or, uh, uh, or, or all other you know the visual or all all data can be stored and. Uh, effectively utilized for the product recovery or uh, uh, trend forecasting, right? So that part, uh, yeah, there would be, I think, uh, uh, okay, Professor uh, uh, will be able to talk more than me, right? So uh, in Europe, uh, we have, they have uh, the GDPR. Uh, in India also, I think, uh, Professor will be actively working on uh, 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 the ethical rules on this side. Yeah, so this privacy is a main thing among the ethics. So if you look at the AE and ethics, there are multiple parts are there. One is the, the privacy, the second is the fairness. For example, fairness is like, so so in other industries, something like uh, recruitment happens through AE algorithm, right? So how fair it is, right? So those kind of questions will not be that important in the uh, fashion industry. So the third part would be the transparency how transparent the algorithms are, right? So it's mainly the uh, customer choices, so that is why relatively lesser in uh, these aspect of it. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you, Vinu. So from there, I would like to go to, again, Stylumia and uh, Udan, because uh, I know that your, um, the, the client circle, the client network is totally different. And of course, both of you said a word about sustainability and said that you work on the feedback of it. So I want to know, and I'm sure that there is some sort of a difference in the way Udan works and also Stylumia. So I just want to know, where, where do you take this feedback from, uh, Hema, uh, for Stylumia? Like if you have to understand the consumer much better. So what do you think is uh, for Stylumia is the most ideal thing? And the second question, which is going to tag along with that, is it because you are from the fashion market and Udan is not. So does that matter? What is the context? So. Sure. So what we do, I'll just then explain what is it that we do. So today, how many people from fashion business here, somebody working remotely with a brand? Quite a few. So we usually have benchmark brands. We look up to some brands. We go, we look at, maybe they are Parisian brands. Maybe they are some Indian brands. What we do is we have smart algorithms that can figure out what's working for them. So when you benchmark somebody, don't look at, say, the thousand pieces that they put out. Look at the top hundred. Why do we do it? Today, a bestseller made by a fashion brand sells 20 times faster than the long tail. And to push the long tail, there's phenomenal uh, work required by the brand to do. So where we come from is pick right, pick what is really working in the market, use that to understand trends. So today, if, if a brand wants to know, in India, do I do more of Mandarin collar, or is there something else that's come up? Our data can tell you more and more inching towards, learn what's working in the market and then do. And there's, uh, that's where we get the feedback. Now, just a website like uh, Zara gets around 60 million hits in a month. Um, our Mintra gets around 45 million hits in a month. So there's huge customer data lying there. Tap into it in the right way and learn what's really working for them. Uh, what was your uh, tagline question? What is the impact of this? No, depending on the context, so because you're working in the fashion right. thing, uh, so do you think that this is something which, the, the way you look at it. The, the domain. Yeah, yeah, the way is look, look at it, whether it depends on the context or is it applicable to anybody, you know, selling anything. Right. I think you cannot do anything without the domain experts. Even for us, the reason Salumia is very successful today, 
90% um, credit goes to the customers who have adopted it. A domain expert looking at a, a recommendation from the tool and then saying, okay, this is how it will work for my brand. Without them, it doesn't work. So uh, even I'm sure that's the case for Rodan. Without the domain guys, you can't do much. Uh, in other words, we have a lot of product specialists on our team. Uh, who are also looking at it from that angle. Yes, technology solves a bulk of the problem, but the interpretation, the transparency, the understanding comes from the domain. Okay, that is that is very well said and I think it's clear for most of the people. So I want to move to uh, Gaurav and uh, ask about uh, one thing uh, to just clarify what Udan is working on exactly and also about the whether you do a similar filtering system uh, for the feedback uh, or you just uh, go mass because uh, it is very difficult in India uh, because of the diversity of it, of the country itself. So. No, sir. So very good point, right? So we are in like 10,000 plus pin codes, right? So that shows the diversity. Uh, so I think I echo with what Hima was saying, right? So we do have product specialists and folks who are out on in this on the street in the markets, but we use them to seed uh, some of the data, right? Uh, <clears throat> that's just the seeding process. Trends are very very important, right? Before the season starts, right? Our shopkeepers want to shop for trends, right? So they know what is trending and sometimes they want to find, plus they also want to discover trends, right? They want to understand what could potentially be a trend. Uh, so for us, if you see, we are a platform, we have a lot of user data, right? So what are people viewing, buying, what's happening in your uh, neighborhood, right? So we actually have uh, statistical methods, right? So AI, right? So we mine a lot of these, right? And uh, if you see like that, and we also are a platform, so we also have sellers on the platform right so it's there are three three parties right so one are these experts on the ground right then there are sellers who are selling their products on the platform and buyers right so we have got all these three data points so if if anyone if you have used udan app right is you should try it out there are two things i would say right two features where you can clearly see what we have tried to do uh, one is, uh, of course, an image search, right? So you can take a pattern, a fabric, right? And you can search using the picture, right? So we'll show you things which are similar, things which are trending uh, similar to this, right? There is another thing which we are calling a for you page, okay, for our uh, buyers, right? Uh, TikTok, I'm sure everybody uh, knows, right, before it got banned, right? But there are other apps around here. So what we did was we saw that short videos are a great way, right, to discover, like see something at a very, very uh, large speed, right? So we have a TikTok style video feed on our app, right, where sellers upload small videos, right, new trends, new products, right? And our buyers actually are known to scan through them very, very quickly, right, to discover uh, this is a combination of these, I would say. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, I'll move to Sridhar. And I wanted to ask you that, uh, I know that you work with a vast number of clients, but not in this way. But then when you uh, do this, um, I just, because uh, you don't work just in with clients in India, I guess. Uh, so, so when it comes to policy, uh, I don't know how strong India is with respect to these uh, rules laid out. So how do you deal with this sort of, um, a sort of I wouldn't call it diversity, but the, the lack of regulations which India has? Uh, wh where do you think it's going? I think there are a uh, very interesting question, Ambika. I think there are you know, two parts to the, uh, the whole uh, question. One is... Um, how is India doing in terms of uh, you know uh, other advanced nations uh, when it comes to um, adopting new technologies and thereby the other you know pitfalls that come along with it? Right, that's one thing. Um, if you ask me, my own personal experience is that um, in some of these technologies we are way ahead uh, than other advanced nations, and that's a good thing, right? Um, that's because uh, the workforce here is geared towards really experimenting at the edge and figuring out uh, new solutions. And, and that's, that's become a DNA for our youngsters and that's how the, uh, the entire corporate culture or the new startup culture is, uh, is emerging, right? So uh, we are advanced on that front. But when it comes to uh, regulation, um, 
or uh, you know of course maybe uh, these are all emerging so the i'm i'm also assuming that the regulations will also emerge and india is uh, actively working on privacy policy and and i think a, a couple of versions have been already published and they're there um, but um, but it's not it's not uh, as advanced as gdpr or uh, the of course as draconian as californian privacy laws or uh, one of those things but i think we need to sort of uh, bring a balance uh, to sort of experimenting with technology and also regulation. And a lot of regulation, I personally feel that it should be internally driven by every corporate uh, or a startup rather than actually an external body trying to regulate you, right? Um, that We've seen that in the past. It scuttles the innovation. It scuttles the growth, a uh, whole bunch of issues. So if the, if the startups are responsible by themselves and, uh, and have... Um, robust frameworks internally, uh, whether it is for sustainability or ethics or you know bias mitigation and a whole bunch of these things. I think that's a much better, uh, much better approach rather than depending on external uh, regulation, whether it is government or uh, or even industry bodies. That's what I would uh, say. Okay. Thank you for that. So, Dr. Das, so I, I know that um, uh, you work with quite a bit with the government on these things. So, do, so do they really consider what uh, Sridhar was uh, talking about when you're having these discussions, or how, how does the government see this, these, uh, these policies as? Okay. So, uh, you see, government is always a, uh, facilitate the uh, policy in favor of, uh, say, any business house or the citizens. These are the two fundamental of them. However, government has uh, uh, always waits on the one thing is very important is called, uh, which is coming to the market present or future. They want to study that. Mm. So one thing this hall, this whole room should, and, and now they know, but they should understand that the technology which is presently there or future will come will change the whole business of fashion in a paradigm shift. Mm. For an example, uh, previously the designer, the famous designers was the central point of any fashion. So where they come out with a design and they put it into the market and pe people, the whole world used to follow this, this company's design, that company's design. But due to the change in technology like augmented reality or virtual reality mm. coming on a mobile phone, mm and also the screen of the browsing in front of you, every citizen will be a designer over the time. Mm. They will tell, okay, you add this, do this, do that, and all. So now the policies, and I'm coming to the policy, but the, according to the change in technology, which is available to the hands and comfortable the people are, they will detect us, hey, you change your things for us like this. Mm. This we like, this is the next generation. And which will be a paradigm shift, why? Because for that technology, we have the infrastructures getting ready. Mm. For an example, the 5, 4G is there, 5G, I'm coming from network to Professor Chiranjeevi is there, Vinu is there. So they will be coming from the database data science kind of things or the policy kind of thing. But pol all those things will lead to, the, the, the enabler will be the technology. Mm. Big change will come. Mm. So we have to envision that from now. I'll give you two classic examples. We have never thought that doctors will be available on net during the COVID. COVID changed our perception yeah. completely. And not the big changes happen in education also. Huh? Another big thing changed happened which you have never thought of. The whole judiciary happened on the net also. That they are thinking of which they have a 9th and 10th of this month. Next week they have a national debate with the highest people so the how to change so the technology is now becoming changing us a lot mm. and this um, uh, so we have to predict those things and uh, we have to domain knowledge no doubt very important as Hema said domain knowledge will not go but the domain with the technology what will be the policy of the government government is waiting for the government is asking us what you want change of course government will keep one thing in mind that it has to be ethical always mm because it should not impact the citizens or business neutral somewhere. Government like that or is neutral from their point of view. So these things discussion happens, of course happens. For that only the government has now funded a huge uh, sum of money, which is a big, uh, around 3.5 million to start the US dollars, kind of, Indian rupee I can say that, 
to start a center of that, that policies, ethics of the AI should be taken care of properly. Okay. So, since you brought up the point of COVID and pre-COVID and post-COVID, now it looks like, you know, um, uh, like the BC and AD. Uh, so, it's like pre-COVID era and the post-COVID era. There's so much of difference, just not in the healthcare sector, but it's reflected everywhere mm -hmm. that you can see, whether it's in classrooms or whether it's in buying, the, the, the way people buy things or look at things. And I wanted to ask, actually, Udan this question that I know that you are supporting Kirana stores uh, like that. So, but uh, how, do you, how do you think is going to be this balance of uh, you know, the physical stores and the online stores? Do you see a vast change in the trend? Because some people who are not so close to the technology, uh, not even using Zoom. I see that everybody knows how to use Zoom. Everybody knows how to use WhatsApp call. They also know how to do online shopping. So do you think this is going to really strongly affect the balance between these two? Because there is a question of livelihood of people who are having physical stores. So how, how do you see this as a person who's handling both? So <clears throat> I think there is, there is an obvious, like very clear shift, right? To online e-commerce, right? But I, I think the offline commerce, right, is here to stay along with it. I think it will be a balance. Uh, Today it is more than 90%, right? Which is which is offline, and if you see, like, we actually very very strongly, right, align with uh, the fact that we believe that India shops a lot of large part of India shops offline, and we want to bring the same experiences there, right? So if you are, can we actually make it easy for a shopkeeper, right? to buy uh, products in small quantity, right? So maintain a small inventory, get the latest trends, sell them, right? And again, replenish it, right? So similarly for on the Kirana side, right? Maintain small inventory, be able to very, very quickly replenish, uh, get next day delivery, get like four hour deliveries, right? So I think what we are trying to do is we're trying to bridge that gap, right? So today we have seen on selection, on pricing, on convenience, right? Somehow like that there is a perception and there is that reality, there is a gap between online and offline, right? And Udan as a platform is actually working very, very strongly, right? In empowering these uh, and entrepreneurs, bridging that gap, right? And we, we, we were very, very strongly behind this. Uh, we believe uh, offline is here to stay, but it will be a hybrid, it will be a combination. Yes, sure, sure, sure. And anybody, uh, yeah. just like Sridhar, can tell me if you want to add a point. You don't have to wait for my question because yeah. it's not a classroom at all. <laughs> we <laughs> wanted to have as interactive as yeah. possible. J just, just want to add a point. In fact, uh, apparently pre-COVID, um, the e-commerce portion is about 11% of the entire retail sales in the, in the world. Sridhar, the mic, can you hold it up? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but uh, during the uh, COVID, it has uh, risen up to some 15%. That means there's a huge jump in just one, two years. But then, off late, it is again coming back, dipping to about 13%. That means it is actually plateauing, and uh, it's not that it's not that the world is going to be fully online, right? That's a good thing. The, but if you look at the you know uh, a broader canvas of e-commerce, you know I sort of sort of uh, look at it from three waves perspective. The first wave was about uh, convenience. You know, you, you, you go online, um, you know, you click something and it arrives at your doorstep, right? It's brilliant. It's beautiful, right? Um, that was the first wave and, you know, um, uh, it, it worked well and, you know, uh, it sort of spawned new industries. Now, uh, the second wave is all about shopping experience. Now, what people have realized over the last, you know, few couple of decades is the e-commerce experience is lonely. Right? You don't, you know, you don't go, go out with friends in the shop or, you know, you, go, you don't go out with family and shop um, and so many other things. For example, you have to sort of wade through hundreds of filters and figure out, even to figure out the, you know, right product and, and there's nobody to converse with. So that is the uh, second way where the shopping experience changes and on, an offline experience needs to come into the online world and that's where the social commerce, a ton of uh, startups in that space, social commerce or group commerce or even conversational commerce are emerging and that's where we operate too. For example, you can, you can actually converse, I know you feel welcomed and then you, know, you sort of ask for a product rather than actually clicking through the filters instead of you know, something like saying that I want to, I'm looking for a purple, a long purple dress or something like that and then you know, uh, 
and then you would say, okay, do you have that in red or something like that, right? So you're, you're actually conversing and then uh, delivering a shopping experience. So that's the second wave. And the third wave, in my view, would be the immersive commerce. Um, that would be you bring in AR, VR, and extended reality all together. Uh, and of course, and then you know, shop inside metaverses and, and, uh, and bunch, of, bunch, bunch of technologies like that. So that's how I see it. That's a great point, Sridhar, because I think this evolution is quite exciting and I don't know how much we know um, where it's going to, but there's so many uh, obvious, uh, obvious realization and branches which exist. So I want to ask the next question to Chiru, that um, uh, in, in terms of research, uh, just not in your lab, but I'm sure you're aware of you know, what's happening with your colleagues as well. Did, did they really uh, change the, uh, the way the academic research uh, revolves around these subjects, depending on what is a need or application? Because right now what is, is, is quite evident is that there has been a tr uh, changing trend and also what people want, like what, um, uh, what uh, Sridhar was saying about the different waves. The, the, the need of the world is very different. So are you sort of changing uh, in terms of your research solutions according to what's happening around or is it going as per pre-COVID era, if I may add? So, uh, see, all of us, uh, uh, I'll take a little long time, okay? Please take, please take, we have enough time. <laughs> so please bear with me. Okay. So in, uh, in ISC, for example, we are all benchmarked against uh, our output, that is research output, and is measured in publications in top tier forums. So longevity of a problem like this is basically six months. Mm. So we are always, you know, on our toes. Mm. You know, uh, so, uh, so basically we say that, look, you know, if you go to sleep, you know, somebody in California is not sleeping at that point. Mm. So students are focused on the next conference paper. I mean, that's my competition. So it, there is a, the ecosystem is such mm. that you, if you aspire to publish in the top tier forums where they're engaged in problems of the day, we have to innovate every second. Mm. I mean, maybe I'm you know, saying a little, uh, it, there's a hyperbole there, but, but probably that's the message. So yeah, we have yes. to, you know, change and we are changing and that's part of the thing. Now coming back to more specific point, for example, what is research activity so far as fashion is concerned? This is a very applied side of things I would say, you know, or conversational AI is concerned. So ISC's focus has always been on more foundational side of things. Of course, colleagues here uh, engage in opportunistically depending on uh, the collaborations they can strike with leading companies. For example, we are fascinating problems which Madam mentioned, the long tail. I was involved in one of those, but the problem is you know, both, uh, both of them will say lots of data is there, but not for us. <laughs> you can al always counter him, uh, Hema, if, if you think he's not going in the right direction. No, there is not enough data. Not enough data there for is us. Not enough data. Yeah. So, so that is where this thing has to happen. And of course, and, and those sensibilities also, right? They're a company, they have, uh, the, um, the consumers have trusted them and entrusted them, right? And not to be mm. shared with uh, others. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, so that is why this kind of research has not happened uh, to the extent which should happen, but of course AR, VR, competition, uh, computer vision, uh, speech, etc., is there. And maybe let me also take this opportunity, as I said, a little long, I will just also mention, no, no, please, a, please, please, uh, mention a few things about uh, which Hema mentioned and maybe also respect to Uran. So, so as you can see probably I'm not a very fashionable person. And uh, I don't know about you, but you know, so, so several years ago, a company uh, just approached me and said, uh, uh, here's a good problem in, f in fashion. I said, fashion, me, I mean, are you talking to the right guy? I mean, and, and anything that, I, I mean, anything, uh, somehow I don't want to work on problems which does not, I couldn't connect to. So then, then I was educated on the fact that the, this is one of the very few industries where India is a producer as well. Often we consume things. The amount of, the number of people it employs at the grassroots level is amazing. Mm. And I was literally 
quite amazed to hear this, the impact of it. And of course, the companies like them are doing great job in trying to mm. find employment and sales and all that, right? So then, then I dug deeper. So, so what is a challenging problem there? And there's learned a few things which I want to share with you, and which is probably common knowledge if you don't know fashion. So what is fashion, I asked. So then a simplistic answer is uh, what everybody wears is fashion. Now what's the hard about it? The what is hard about it? That means people who, that means what you do is, you look at a window of six months, number of things show, sold, you just give it to them. Mm. What's so hard? What's so hard about it? Problem. Now there's one more problem. So this is called the most popular recommendation, right? Most popular event is to recommend. Now that will not work in a fashion because the number, diversity of things which we have. Just look at any side number of shirts which we have, right? So now that's the, called the long tail problem. And now each shirt has been made by some artisan somewhere, mm. right? So now the challenge is that how can we sell this? And also just because, uh, you know, then all of us agree, well, that is fashionable, but there is something else which is called style. So style is a very personal thing. So I could get into this fascinating problem, there's one paper we wrote, but I, but we could go very long on that. So I think this fashion, style and the long tail uh, could be a very interesting research problem, uh, you know, uh, and which has some practical consequences. But why am I boring you with all that? Maybe to inspire them to give us some data, I guess. But thank you. <laughs> so that's what I have to say. I don't know how much, you know. Yes. Chiru being Chiru, I understand. And I wanted to know your take no. on it. I know Hema wants to speak. <laughs> no, no, no. I am completely aligned with him. It takes humongous data. That's why we've gone to internet for our data, right? Because one single brand cannot give us so much data if you want to solve. So I'm completely aligned with him. The another point I wanted to touch is, I think about, we were speaking about how e-com versus offline. It'll be interesting to segregate what are the customers we've acquired and where are they from. Yeah. Most of the customers, e-commerce, um, major platforms like Mintra, Nika, they cater to or Tire 2, Tire 3. Yeah. All of us sitting here from Metro towns, Tire 1 towns, we are spoiled for choices. I want to buy a Veramode address, I have 20 locations, I have anywhere I can go and buy. Uh, if I want to send a Vermont address to my mother who is sitting in Madurai, which is a Tier 2 town, Tier 2 city, uh, and there is no Vermoda outlet there, then I show her on Mintra and she makes a choice. Similarly, let us elevate the problem. Someone wants to buy a MAC lipstick. Is somebody in a Tier 3 city in Punjab not fashionable? No, they are very fashionable. They don't have access to all these big brands and stuff, right? So that's the revolution e-commerce has brought. Not for us. We are too spoiled for ch uh, choices, right? And uh, especially somebody like me, I probably won't even buy from brands. I can see a fabric. Given my background, I'll be like, oh, this is a better fabric. I'll pick this. So when we think of e-com, it's always interesting to split what market have we acquired. Right? There could be ups, there could be downs, there could be plateau. Maybe tier 3 market is uh, skyrocketing. Right? My father who only knew Max, <laughs> today has, uh, he talks about uh, various brands. He wants an H&M t-shirt, he wants something else. That's the revolution e-com has bought and that's what I wanted to add. Yeah. I know that Gaurav is wanting to really talk about this and especially Gaurav uh, really deals with, I think, Pan-India and with like tier 2, tier 3 cities actually. So I just want to know your take on that, Gaurav. No, it's a, I think so. selection is a real problem, right? What Hema is saying, right? Uh, for tier 3 cities, for example, one big reason why they are on e-commerce is selection. Right, so I have a friend who sits who's sitting in Raurkela. Right, he buys even like everything he needs for tennis. Right, he buys online. Right, and the tolerance to platforms, prices, uh, shipping time, convenience is high. Right, so selection is a thing, and I think we recognize this. Right, I believe that selection is two ways. Right, one is for a buyer, what is the selection options? Right price ranges, brands like Hema was saying, right? How can we actually get uh, this personalized, I would say, right? Different region, micro regions uh, in India are very, very different, right? Within a city also, how can you get the right selection to that shop, right? Other aspect of selection in India is, I think, very, very uh, prevalent, right? So, is different types, right? I'll talk about clothes and shoes, different things, they are actually are manufactured in different regions, 
right? So like woolen wear, right? Ludhiana, Punjab area, right? Uh, Lenin would be one area, right? Hosri would be Tirpur, right? So our ability to identify all of these pockets, right? And I would say ki empower some of the other regions, right? Especially if you see regions like Northeast, right? They may not, may not have seen some of those, right? Uh, so getting that to those, uh, again, but our, the way we do is we get that selection to the right uh, retailer, right Kirana store, right? But I think selection is a real problem, right? Uh, and I like completely align with him, right? India, right? All of India is fashionable. Everybody wants to consume, right? Uh, somebody just needs to bring that huge selection to them. So here I may add, so one of the things is that we love, we let me think of it as individualistic, right? So basically fashion means you're following somebody. So the real challenge is not that you say, I, I would take offense to that. India will say we're all, you know, uh, we have all our own styles. So our own styles, right? And that's the challenge of it. So now here, uh, you know, I just wanted to add. Zero the mic, closer. Yeah, sorry. So just want to add to what you were saying when we look at this. So in our research, we found the following interesting aspect. So when you say, what is this? now we come back to the question, what is style now? The style is that, you know, you, you prefer a particular color of shirt. I mean, this is very, you know, broadly speaking, right? A, a color, suppose a male thing in the shirt or a pant, a particular color of a belt. Now, so why are you talking about e-commerce company, right? If somebody has a blue shirt, and I know this person's style is like this. So maybe the person may be interested in a black pant. So that is the thing you can sell. So basically, the most of the money comes not from what, you, what you're asking, see the below, right? So that is the opportunity. And that brings us to the question that if you can understand, you know, as you said, you want to take it to new markets, right? Now, if you can find the styles, that would be the opportunity, of, at least I think it's an opportunity. You guys are the guys who have the money pots. <laughs> but, but anyway, so I'll just bring this up. That's yeah. the recommendation engines is what you're talking about, right, Chiru? Yes. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's a, you know, of course, a brilliant trend in e-commerce that's brought in. So you bought something or, you know, you looked at something and then you, you know, the, the platform suggests something to you. But then that's also bringing out another uh, problem, which is you're getting stalked. You go and you know, look for one product and every website you go there, you're like targeted, targeted, targeted. Yes. It's so painful, right? You know, you, then you start, start using uh, all kinds of control so that nobody tracks you and stalks you, all that. So that's, uh, that's another you know, key trend that's emerging. I, I just wanted to add. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so that is the thing which we, st uh, in the starting we said that uh, this recommendation engine and the stocks and all will lead to some biasness maybe. So this biasness may be dominated by the muscle power or the money power of the companies or the policies of the countries. So then comes the ethics, the how to control. It's not easy. So we have to, the policies of the government, policies of the laws may come in on that direction. So there slowly, slowly uh, uh, things are coming in. So it will take some time. So there are a lot of research going on how to tweak or control this kind of recommendation engines where because ultimately customer may buy something which he uh, he is forced to buy mm -hmm. that was the concern yeah this is something i want to ask you we know i know that you're also ready to talk so whatever it is go ahead uh, i will ask you after that no i mean uh, i was uh, planning to continue with uh, professor chidu was talking about you were asking about the research part right yes uh, so i'll start from there uh, okay so if you look at the the milestones in the a so the one main milestone is the uh, in on vision that CNN convolutional neural network that 2015 onwards uh, there are more and more uh, uh, work on that okay and uh, so if you really look at so there are various paradigms are there in uh, artificial intelligence so long back it was just like a if loop like expert systems so if if conditions are met then give that output would be like that. So then comes the intelligent agents. So that was more of a, a engineering concepts. So now the, the major paradigm in artificial intelligence is a deep learning. So we, wherever uh, you know, we talk about artificial intelligence, so that is what mainly being reflected, okay? So deep learning, uh, so if you look at AI, uh, you can, uh, machine learning, you can think of subset of AI, and uh, deep learning is a subset of uh, uh, the machine learning, okay? 
so on a research front, uh, what happens is most of the all one main problem with the deep learning algorithm is the explainability. Okay, so it's very good for uh, prediction. So that's why uh, for uh, you know companies they can employ you very well, and uh, we can make use of money with the prediction. Okay, but, but when it comes to research. So the uh, generalizability, the explainability is uh, the more important part. Mm. So that is why uh, actually on that model part of site, the research is being, uh, uh, it's slow. So there are, researchers are there. Uh, there are more research papers are on the ethics side, AI and society, AI as a strategic suit. So that level researchers are there. Uh, but uh, the uh, I, I work a couple of uh, uh, on uh, the AI uh, research project. So we use uh, some part uh, like the machine learning algorithm, but ultimately, you know, the research paper should have uh, some explainability, right? So something, some generalized uh, fact should be talked about. So that way we can contribute to the conversation, okay? So that's the way the research been going on now. Okay, oh. so what I wanted to ask you other than this, you okay. know, is about uh, consumer behavior. So what Chiru was telling about, uh, you know, about the personalized thing, the style and things right. like that. And as a, uh, as a professor from IAM, where you teach management students, and these are the students, I guess, they will uh, be all wanting to be entrepreneurs, start a company, head a company. So how do you, how do you approach this as a researcher in teaching these students about these, I wouldn't say just values, but also uh, sort of warning them, giving warning signs as to what they have to look out for when they start a company on their own. Okay, uh, consumer behavior part, maybe I'll talk about a little bit on the marketing side. So you look at it like uh, advertising is one thing, uh, uh, campaign, uh, next thing, then comes the recommendation system. So if you look at the advertising, uh, like so their what channel to be used, market mix models, so there the, the explainability part is more, not too much AI being used, mm. okay? Then comes the, uh, the campaigning, mm. right? So like now, if you look at uh, 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 like maybe pre-COVID, uh, so now there are more use of uh, uh, social media influencer, uh, the companies are using social media influencer, right? Mm. So you, we can see many uh, short films, so indirectly, you know, they would be talking about maybe one minute to talk about uh, their product and right so uh, so like to identify a correct uh, social media influencer right so their a can be used because if you just go by just absolute numbers what happens is uh, so if you select four or five people maybe they all targeting a same number of customers right so if you're looking carefully there are little more details are there so the a can play a role so then comes the recommendation system so in fashion, it's a very relevant thing because I have a little different opinion about fashion. I don't know, I don't know uh, the full definition of, uh, so for me, it is a subject that deals with uh, psychology, the culture, right? So the society or, or all are part of uh, the fashion. So the individuality that uh, also coming in, right? So, so there, you know, the recommendation system actually scores. Uh, so, uh, uh, right, so their AI actually uh, very effective, but if you look in terms of metrics, it's very uh, sad. Like, uh, if out of 100 people, uh, you know, the four may be only being, they will be able to do, if they can do success, that itself a good money for a company, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, right, so uh, in e-commerce, uh, now what I see that, uh, my, I have a daughter, so my daughter's friend, mm. she was a big fan of BTS and uh, so she wanted to have a BTS uh, sweatshirt. So I don't think, so I'm from Trichy, so there is no shop sells a BTS uh, shirt. So, so the e-commerce and all like, you know, that customized uh, products, e-commerce is like uh, uh, o uh, online shopping is uh, uh, very effective in, the, in that side, yeah. Yes, so I, I have a very interesting question to actually know personally also because um, 
you know you said about bts and this is how merchandise sells and this is how sometimes markets are ruled basically uh, movies because i know that uh, somebody the other day told me in china when especially when you have these series which people are like really crazy about all the merchandise can be ordered online which is present in the series so and that sort of uh, you know lets you i wouldn't i don't know whether to use the word force but somehow lets you make a choice because that is not something maybe naturally you would go for so you should ask your daughter also whether if bts was not so famous she would still go for that t-shirt so i just want to know the take of uh, stylumia and udan and sense forth actually on this uh, this this uh, way of driving consumer behavior through media no absolutely in fact i'll give you the reverse of it uh, right um, till now i think everybody was speaking about data bias about how we have little data uh, let me ask a question to the audience how many of you own more than 100 fashion products like t-shirt shirts put together yeah uh, how many of you more than 50 most of us i think yeah <laughs> definitely most of us so now um, for the people who have more than 100 outfits in your wardrobe how many of you do you wear regularly yeah 10 15 yeah what about that 85 uh, that you bought and it's in your wardrobe mm. all of us are evaluating that data thinking you bought it you liked it and mm. we are asking brands to make more of those right, right? right. Uh, there is no reverse feedback mm. right i use this i didn't use this that is a bigger bias we are dealing with today if i am uh, working with a brand today that's making for gen z influencer uh, influenced by the influencer marketing all of that what we don't know is what about the 85 that was never worn mm. and that's there mm. that's influencing so let's say i bought this dress i don't like it after the event somebody says you look terrible why did you buy this i'm not going to wear this again but the brand has already this data point somebody from bangalore ordered this maybe 10 more people yeah. they are going to make more of this next season all right that is a, a a worse bias i'm afraid of Uh, of course yeah we've always i uh, you know not just now we saw somebody wearing a sari hema malini was wearing a sari my mom went and bought it that that always remains we always like aspirational people around us i think this is a bigger danger than um, you know forced uh, buys or marketing i'll i just want to ask uh, gorav about this thing that uh, I, i know fashion works in a different way but then even for the retailers uh, do do you think this 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 sort of a feedback which is sort of a false positive feedback does that um, uh, does that apply to you how do you deal with it so see for us i think it would uh, largely apply in proactive uh, inventory planning right so are there like trends which are happening in the offline space which you want to latch on to capture right and predict what kind of demand uh, our shopkeepers will see right hence we as a platform will see right uh, but i i think there is one thing we we are like keen on building i would say ki we don't have a good uh, handle on is uh, what do we not carry right so things which we have right so we do a good job at organizing it uh, like chiru was saying style is personalized helping people navigate around their personal preferences right so you start somewhere and very quickly get to things which you like right but what if the platform does not have any uh, does not carry right how do i get that input and for me as a platform what is valuable is get that input at scale right so it is not just call calling a few people and knowing right i want to know what is happening in different pin codes right where am i falling short right a, a big nuance here is for in a lot of these regions there are regional brands right or regional styles which are very very popular right so that is something also which i need to understand right so i i would say like the answer to your question there is a strong connect between the trends offline and what you do right i would say this is a unsolved problem right now sridhar i would like to know your take on it as sure, well sure sure i have a slightly different take i think uh, uh not everything is hunky dory with e-commerce right so for example just because you put you know your products out there online people are going to come and buy it right there's no forcing absolutely now brands today are spending five times more uh, uh to get the same traffic that means if you're if they were spending 1 million dollars on advertising to drive traffic to your e-commerce site now they have to spend 5 million that's huge right and 
And the pitfall is that only 2% of the visitors actually buy on e-commerce. Now that is, that is, you know, is, is, is brilliant, right, in, in a way, in the sense that people are not going to be, you're not going to be able to force anybody to buy anything. They will buy it only if they want it or if they need it, right? So those are, those are some things that are going to exist. Now, um, but of course, the, the other concepts like the DTC is emerging, which is direct to consumer, right? Um, and these are brands which are not traditionally on e-commerce. They are trying to sell directly to consumers. And that is a huge trend that's emerging. And what's happening is, and why they're doing it, uh, especially CPG kind of companies, they have layers and layers of middlemen, you know, in terms of distributors and wholesalers and, you know, retailers and all that, right? So they can actually sort of skip all those layers and improve their margins, provide lower prices, and have, more importantly, one-to-one -one relationship with the customer. And that's the most brilliant uh, thing that's emerging. And a lot of these brands, uh, you know, like for example, Nike or these brands which were selling uh, in the stores, they're trying D2C and that's working very well for them. Um, and then there are two more points that I'd, I, I would add. Uh, another thing is um, uh, DNVB, which is Digital Native Vertical Brands. Uh, these brands emerged because of e-commerce and they are purely digital. They don't have stores, they don't exist anywhere else. They, they, you know, they, everything is digital for them. And those brands are doing very well. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's another uh, facet to look at uh, when you're thinking of e-commerce. And, uh, and riding on all this, the traditional e-commerce players have uh, uh, their own brands and what I call them as the backyard brands. And, and they are, I, I think they're gonna die. Because they, they think that you know, okay, somebody's buying this and they you know, get somebody to manufacture something and put their brand on it and, and try and sell it online. And that uh, never works and you know, is not gonna work. So these are some of the thoughts. Okay, and I, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll come to uh, Vinu soon, but then before that I want to ask both of you um, that uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, I especially Gaurav, where he works with a lot of these Kirana stores, and I just wanted to um, understand when you work with these Kirana stores and when you approach them for um, uh, helping them out, and this is where, uh, you know, uh, where Hema's point comes into picture, where it's, it's not concerned with the tier one city, because here I think it's, it's more easy, it's more organized maybe, and every, everything is accessible to everyone, so they can, there is some sort of a rhythm which is running in the city, because uh, you know exactly what they want, and they know exactly how, how they should approach, but when you approach these Kirana stores in these little villages, how do you approach them, how do you convince them to go through this whole exercise of technology bit? So, so I think two parts, right, to yeah. that, right? So I don't think even at this time, right, anybody needs convincing on technology, right? We used to think internally, right, are our buyers tech savvy or not, right? But with advent of so many B2C apps, right, WhatsApp, Facebook, right, or most of these guys, right, especially like the next generation, they are on on mobile phones, technology is not a barrier, I would say, right? Mm. With the right experiences, mm. right? Design, for example, is a big thing for us internally on how we design the app, right? Mm. Our experiences. What really matters is can we actually do what they need, right? To run their business on the app, right? To tell you like some of these like tier two, tier three stores, right? In lifestyle. Mm. A lot of these guys actually travel to uh, big cities, mm. Bangalore, Delhi, right? Mm. To find, right? They want to latch on to what is trending. Next season, what is going to actually happen, mm. right? Mm. So for us, the story is we can bring you all of that on the app, right? We can bring you the trend. We can bring you the most reliable sellers. We can go to these pockets like Tirpur, Ludhiana, get their products, real brands over here. Uh, one of the other things I think when Venu was saying, right, I think explainability is also a big one, right? Yes. Real, practically like validated, they want to, uh, what I call, they want to hear the sales pitch, right? I am yes. actually happy to take this product from you, but how should I sell it to my customer, right? So why is this trending? What is it about this product, right? If you can generate that, uh, empowers these guys. 
Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Gaurav, for that. And Hema wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. just yes. adding that, uh, see, typically, how do we run business? We say we are a B2B company, B2C company, D2C company. I think all of this will change if your mindset change that I'm a C2B company, mm. right? My business is not at the center. My consumer is at the center, mm. right? Find out the right ways to research for that particular consumer. If it is social, it's social. Mm. Uh, we were recently in Middle East, someone said that entire Saudi Arabia, you want to know what's the taste of that customer, go to Snapchat. They are okay. not there on Instagram. They are not there on TikTok, mm. right? Mm. What, where, where are your customers? Research that uh, area well mm. and make the business a C2B one, not, um, not putting your business at the center. I think that's the only thing I wanted to add. Okay, so I have a question uh, to Vinu. Uh, so right now I, I understand that the whole thing, the scenario, though we have a lot of solutions, the problems, the questions remain more. And I, I want to know whether from um, when you are uh, dealing with management students, for example, and when you have a curriculum, and which is, as I asked uh, Chiru, it's quite ever evolving because the markets are changing, trends are changing. So the, their thought process also has to change. Of course, you can't go month to month to update these curriculum. So how, how engaged uh, is your board at IAM Trichy? Is uh, engaged or uh, agreeing to the fact that um, your uh, curriculum board has to have people like Stylumia or Udan or Senseforth in designing the curriculum to make it quite up to date so that they are aware of the trend? Or are you just uh, 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 you know, doing this from a very third, part, uh, third party uh, perspective? Uh, okay, actually, it has to be driven from the faculty side. So, if faculty, uh, I mean, they are having the initiative. Mm. Uh, it, all can, it all will be done, right? So, uh, so typically, IAM, so there will be more freedom compared to the university system. So, uh, so that's why uh, we also have a series of uh, guest lectures. Most of the IAMs are having incubators, mm. right? So, uh, uh, so that's why, uh, in my opinion, IAMs are, uh, you know, in terms of in, in, in including the latest trend, uh, most of the IAMs are actually doing a good job, right? Especially ABC, yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I'll come to the audience bit in, in three, four minutes. I, I will give a chance to the audience as well. But then before that, I just needed to get this somewhere because we just have uh, five minutes to close. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to ask Chiru and Dr. Das also. So because both of you have a required amount of autonomy, as I understand, when you have to design these curriculum for the students. So how much do you uh, take into account these real problems and maybe keep uh, either of them or, uh, you know, in, in your board to sort of uh, design the curriculum and things like that. So I just want to know the takes of different institutes. You want to go at first? Chiru? Because he took the name. <laughs> then I'll no, 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 no. <laughs> the name has nothing to the order of my preference. Please, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so, we, uh, so we do it in the following way. Our students go out for internship regularly to the top uh, companies. Uh, we, all of us are encouraged to consult with companies. Mm. Uh, so those are the essential feedback. Uh, and, that, and all of us are encouraged, as I mentioned before, to publish. And now to have topical problems, we need to solve, uh, you know, we need to build capacity in our students. And that we do by engaging in them in short projects. So these are the three ways, yeah. you know, our um, curriculum changes. But if you see syllabus will not change. But if you ask a batch two, two batches ago and say, what assignments did you do? Yeah. Those have changed. Yeah. What projects did you do? So yeah. that is the way we incorporate feedback. Bad. And of course, we change syllabuses as well. Yes. But that's the way we continuously evolve our curriculum. Okay. Okay. So let me go ahead. This is a very good question from you see, the, uh, I'll go quickly. Mm. So the, the, the highest body in this academia, autonomous bodies, are, are called the Senet or called the academic mm. uh, program uh, uh, final decision-making bodies. And in universities, generally these autonomous institutes like uh, IIITs, we have three types. One is undergrad, fourth and the after class 12, masters and the PhD. So for everyone, the input and the target output is also different. 
So the curriculum or you can say the process of graduation for the degree are different. So if you look at the undergrad or the postgrad, which is called master's programs, so where there, there are, the process is that uh, we in these senate bodies, we have academicians from the institutes and also the external um, uh, uh, personalities are there because we are autonomous, we can invite. And in the external, generally people from industry and academia is there. So this industry and academia people who are there, they don't look at in any individual industry. They don't look at, I say, say the, I want to go for Intel or a, or a individual like hardware design or, so they are, make the curriculum more broader. Like data science people may work on fashion design or, or the you know, sociology people may work on fashion design because it is a style and all kind of things. So in the curriculum, there is a flexibility there. If they want to, the, the core courses are fundamental for their, they have to go through. For the electives, they can go to this kind of design. And also, as Professor said, the projects. They can do some projects along with the particular industry and all in their internship or before that, along with the professor. So those flex flexibility we bring into the curriculum. Another interesting thing which is there, if somebody wants to go to a fashion design technology, entrepreneurship sales are there. Also this in, we call it as incubation cell inside the campus. Is any student or any faculty member can collaborate with any company or funding from the government to start those kind of startups to work for. Okay, thank you for that nice uh, roundup because I think it sort of also helped understand the industry who is present here to see how the academia works and it's, though, though it looks like two different worlds, there is a lot of uh, overlap and a lot of uh, incorporation that one needs to do and which is being done gradually. But then uh, I think uh, from what they said, uh, because it's IAM, IAC and uh, IIIT Bangalore, where there's a lot of scope for uh, integration and incorporation into the entire system. So with that, I would ask uh, the audience, I know that we have a gentleman sitting over there uh, who wants to add some points. So can, can, can a volunteer give a mic to him? Maybe, uh, yeah. He wants to ask a question. No, it's not a question. Okay, he wants to add a point, okay. Can you also tell your name and introduce oh, yourself, yes. where you're coming from? Very much, very much. I'm Desikan, R.S. Desikan. I'm from SRM University, AP. I come from, I have a, my own business, uh, education background is from IIT and I am, I am Bangalore. I am officiating as a dean at, for the B school. Talking about the curriculum, we have a very structural way of doing it. The first stage is the board of studies, and then there is an academic council and the board of management. These are all the UGC mandated, you know, horrible things. The board of studies always have, uh, you know, the uh, professors, academia part of it. There are external academic uh, sources, you know, we seek uh, people from IFCs and IITs and yeah. our own connections. Okay. So there is an academia external to your, you know, the creator syndrome avoiders. And there are also industry people. It depends on the subject that you are going to be having, this board of studies. And uh, this uh, board has been, you know, given the authority or they have given this way entire syllabus. You know, the curriculum syllabus up to the topic level, 15 days before, all these things happen. And then the feedback is taken. And even in the board of studies, we do have even student representatives, alumni representatives. So if you look at the curriculum, in a recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pan-India enclave, I spoke about this. The knowledge of uh, pure science and engineering sciences, you know, if you call it a volatility, is fairly stable. Whereas in a B school, the knowledge volatility is fairly high. What I was taught 30 years ago about marketing delivery, I cannot teach my students today. So the volatility, particularly for B schools, need to be continuously taken care of. Whereas argument is principle is argument is principle, uh, fluid dynamics is fluid dynamics, uh, Bernoulli's equation is Bernoulli's equation. So we take special care, particularly the curriculum being very interesting, I thought I should raise the thing. Sure, sure. So you have this structure and the key thing is industry input, alumni input. If you have a strong alumni network, they, we keep interacting with them. They say that what works and what have learned it and what they have not, what are the new things you should do. But there's the practicality of it. I cannot keep changing my PPTs or my syllabus on a daily basis or yearly basis. That's where I look at it at the pedagogical part of it. So I take a latest case study, 
most recent ones, or I discuss some kind of assignment that, you know, what will happen if it is a fashion thing, what would you do? If it is going to be Gaurav's thing, what would you do? So these are all, as uh, Vini said that, you know, sorry, I didn't get your name. Okay, so if uh, the teacher's freedom is where these things are taken care. So the teacher's freedom gets into the pedagogical part of how the knowledge is delivered through cases, discussions, role plays, etc. Otherwise, curriculum changes once a year, perhaps if you do it, particularly on these, what I call the knowledge volatility aspects, I think that's fine. Otherwise, if I'm an engineering uh, faculty, if I have to teach, uh, you know, Bernoulli's equation or acceleration due to gravity, I continue to do so. Okay, Thank you for that. We'll, we'll take it. We'll take it for uh, in, for lunch. You know the discussion uh -huh. because I think no, that no, Hemant to wants to, to say something and then Tulika. So quickly. We're very difficult. We could do a 15-day seminar on the problem because on the one hand we're talking about landfills where millions of people are, millions of garments are lying, and on the other side we're talking about having much too much of a choice, right? Now. Would we be happy if one third, that means two of these six people sitting on the stage, would not have a job because we are producing the right amount? Yeah. Okay, this is something which we have to discuss. And thanks for that, Hemant. I think it's a very valid point. And uh, by the way, Hemant is on the panel after the, the last panel of today. So you know what's going to come. So, <laughs> Tulika, yes. Yeah, thanks. I'll take it from there and from the uh, points that were being discussed. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Tulika Gupta. I'm the director of the Indian Institute of Crafts and Design at Jaipur. Not many people would have heard of it. Uh, everybody's heard of NIFT, so I can say I used to teach at NIFT earlier in Delhi. So uh, now talking about fashion and design and style, I heard a few definitions and I would love to interact more on that. But my question is, we are, uh, you know, uh, what he also said just now, that we have too many landfills and we are using AI to do that. Can we use AI to promote collaborative consumption. Now, now we are doing some research in terms of collaborative consumption and in the West, it's already there uh, because uh, especially wedding clothes, etc. But for the day-to-day -day clothes, one has, uh, as uh, you know, you rightly pointed out, you have 80% of your clothes people, are not, uh, people do not use. And here we are trying to create brands, sell all of that. In India, we have so many people who do not buy branded products also. You know, people who wear sarees, for example, and so many other things. So that is also fashion, uh, you know, and, and, and like that. So how can, my question again, uh, in a small way, how can we use AI to enhance collaborative consumption and less of production, which is not needed? Also, so that's fine. Nobody has lost a job in any of those companies. We've just made a designer's life much, much simpler, right? Uh, along, if I just throw a broad number, uh, our five years in existence, we've stopped around 60 million garments going to the landfill. Now, what did we do to do that, right? A designer had five options. We said, try to take from these two, right? That's all we said. We did not go and say, this designer is useless. Can she move? Can, can't machine do the job, right? Uh, I'll give another example, which is probably removed from fashion. I always give this when I'm meeting fashion people. Imagine a super, uh, you know, super duper neurosurgeon. Uh, right, and he can probably perform uh, three surgeries in a day because the rest of the day he's doing paperwork. And an AI comes and automates that, he does six surgeries. That's what we're doing for designers. That's how technology must be looked at when we are talking about, you know, collaborative consumption or, you know, we want to reduce waste, we want to make our jobs more meaningful. That's where uh, tech's co tech comes in. Coming to collaborative consumption, I think a lot of startups are entering into that uh, area. I think COVID kind of put a, a break on it simply because we became too concerned about um, infection and not sharing. I didn't even share my mom's towel for a bit, uh, right? So I think it'll all pick up. It will pick up, but for sure. Yes. So a lot of lot of discussions offline. I can see so many uh, so many hands, but but huh? One point, okay, last one point, I'll give you 30 seconds. So we have to move on because we have a huge lineup after that. So the landfilling part, I think that we can improve, but that we cannot avoid. Because earlier it was like a, a shopping, then shipping, right? But now uh, Amazon came up with the patent, anticipatory shipping. So that is the model, you know, in online. Because this is part of your, you know, the human traits also, right? So when if you look at Amazon, you know, we, we wanted to buy some laptop. Uh, tomorrow morning itself, you know, it will come to your house. So some part of it is uh, like a 
anticipatory shipping. So this plays a crucial role. So this always end up into the landfill. Okay. Great. We, we will, I know that there's a lot to discuss. And I, I wish to merge panel one and panel two. And I don't know what it will come out of that. So, But then I think that's why we have a lot of lunch and coffee breaks and tea breaks. And I know that so many people want to ask questions. I'm sorry, I cannot take those questions right now. But we will definitely uh, continue these discussions because we have... So thank you, thank you again. <laughs>